sights are more thrilling and few animals are more glamorous than a cheetah in the open. But to get attention for cheetahs is not easy. Serengeti Mara supports only 250 cheetahs in the mountains of Iran. That is where cheetahs survive in Asia. But there's less than 100 individuals. So how do you get a picture of one of them? I brought a battery of camera traps and then we got some interesting results. So it's a pleasure to be back here in Washington together with Chris and talk to you about a new adventure, an adventure with cheetahs. Now, of course, cheetahs are members of this rarefied family of big cats, and there's only seven of them. But even within that rarefied family, cheetahs are different. You know, they're not like lions, the big bullies of the plains. Not like leopards, you know, stealthy survivors in the night. Not like jaguars, those super cats, jungle cats in South America. Or their Asian equivalents, tiger. Not like snow leopards either, you know, specialized in the vertical domain, in the mountains of Asia. If there's any big cat that cheetahs have more in common with, it's the North American cougar, oddly enough. Here's an image of a cougar, photographed by one of my camera traps in California where I live. And check the elongated body, you know, the small head and the long tail, and compare that with a cheetah and you get the idea. You know, they're both derived from the same common ancestor, which lived several million years ago in North America. So in a way, we can claim cheetahs as a North American big cat. Ancestral cheetahs moved out of North America and into Asia and finally ended up in Africa where they came into their own and became these specialized runners that chase after open prey on the plains. Serengeti Mara, it's about 10,000 square miles, supports about 3,000 lions, 9,000 hyenas, well over 1,000 leopards, but only 250 cheetahs. So and these cheetahs have to cope with all the other predators. And that's the reason why so few of their cubs survive into independence. According to some studies in some places, maybe less than 4%. So lions and hyenas have pushed cheetahs into broad daylight. They can't compete with them after dark. They don't even hunt that much in early morning. They want to wait until the lions and hyenas bed down. So broad daylight and everybody's watching them. The wildebeest, the zebras, and then the smaller gazelles at a more safe distance. But the cheetahs don't want to be seen. Like most cats, they really value their privacy, so they try to sneak into the tall grass. That's their preferred hunting domain. And the best of them really use stealth. This was a superb male, you know, old grizzled guy who liked to lie in hiding and wait for hours until the moment was there. And then you'd see this blinding speed and it'd be all over in a matter of seconds. Cheetahs have to be in top condition to do what they have to do. Their margin for error is very, very thin. And if you take that into account, then you really have to marvel at the ability of cheetahs to raise their offspring. Because not only do they have to hunt for themselves, they have to provide for their offspring, and they have to protect them. And if raising one cub is a challenge, then consider what it might take to raise six of them simultaneously. And yet, that is what we saw. Indeed, this was a female who was successfully raising six cubs. We called her Super Mom. But even though the cubs are nearly full grown, they can't hunt yet. They're still utterly dependent on her. They study her, learn from her, imitate her, we watch this mom navigate around the dangers of a cheetah's world with supreme skill and hoped the cubs would pick up every cue. 
Now, there's nothing more miserable than a cat in the rain. And cheetahs are no exception. One day, we watched Supermom and her cubs walk straight into the wildebeest migration. It was a first encounter for the cubs, and Mom just let them all plunge in. But young cheetahs don't always have the best judgment about appropriate prey. This cub was testing itself against a wildebeest that it could never overcome. And then you could see the realization, now what do I do? <laughs> and the cub falls back, good decision. For many centuries, wildlife in the Serengeti Mara has coexisted with Maasai and their livestock. Here's an aerial view of a traditional compound. But now the compounds are getting bigger and bigger, and there's more and more cattle. And that's trouble for cheetahs. Compared with the Mara, cheetahs don't face the same pressures in the Serengeti just across the border in Tanzania. Hiding in the grass here is a mom named Almond, who has hidden her tiny cubs in the rock outcrop while she hunts. When we met Almond's cubs, they were just out of the den, just beginning to discover the world. As they get older, it's nonstop play. And their play is full of the moves they'll need one day, especially the chase. They practice everything on each other or mom. Mom is the center of the universe and a willing victim to the cubs' play. But while they play, she maintains her vigil. She's their provider, she's their defender and teacher, multitasking all the time. <laughs> Supermom really is a superstar. <laughs> Who can resist? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Another story. This is the Farsi word for cheetah, Yuspalang, the hunting leopard. And this is where they live, in the mountains of Iran. It couldn't be farther from the flat, green, lush plains of East Africa, and yet that is where cheetahs survive in Asia. A handful of remote areas in central Iran, it's a salt desert, and the habitats where they still occur cover some 20 million acres, but there's less than 100 individuals. So how do you get a picture of one of them? Well, first you have to get in, and that takes a couple of months of back and forth until the permits are issued, and then you arrive in Tehran, and the face of Imam Khomeini still stares at you everywhere. Uh, I could go there because I still travel on a Dutch passport. Chris is an American citizen, so she couldn't join me there, and nor could we get a writer in. So lots of meetings, and there's always tea, and there's always laughter, and there's always kind of food sitting out in the open. I really came to appreciate the civility and the hospitality of people there. And then the treasure, the privilege of working with somebody like this. Mr. Najefi, who's considered one of the real cheetah experts in Iran, has been looking for them for over 30 years. He's seen them 15 times with his own eyes. That's how rare, that's how elusive they are. So clearly, seeing cheetahs with my own eyes was out of the question. So I brought a battery of camera traps, and then we got some interesting results. <laughs> the hindsight of a leopard and the front side of a curious wolf. <laughs> Mountain sheep coming closer and then wondering what is there. And then one night, one of our cameras saw this ghostly face come closer and closer and closer. And then it got spooked. And this was a passive infrared camera trap. There's no flash going off. There's no shutter clicking. It's just a little box. And yet this cheetah was so shy that it veered off the trail. And that's exactly why I'd set up these small camera traps, because I really needed to see what was happening. 
And at the inside of some of those results, you know, we started deploying the bigger camera traps. And this is one of the trees where we set up you know, one of the camera traps. And we left the camera alone there. It was resupplied with batteries. Cards were exchanged you know, every couple of weeks or every couple of months sometimes. And this is what the camera saw. This is what came by that tree. Persian ibex, jackals, caracals, beautiful cat. And this one, as you can see, got quite accustomed to the camera, leopard. It was really interesting to see what the different community of animals is in which cheetahs live in Iran. You, know, you don't associate them with those animals necessarily. But of course, this is what we were after a lone male cheetah coming to check out that tree. And there he goes again. This individual was the last of its kind, roaming in a huge area in Kavir National Park. And we got pictures of it in traps set up hours and hours apart. He roamed across huge distances, hoping to find a female. And nobody believes there's still a female left. At least not in that area. This male, intriguingly, lives within 100 kilometers of Ahmadinejad's hometown. So cheetahs live in remote places, and yet there are connections with people everywhere. We really wanted to get pictures of him, so we set up camera traps in a dry riverbed. We found out that it's not just the cheetahs who show an interest, there's a pair of striped hyenas as well. These are not like the hyenas that we know from East Africa, these look more like punkers, uh, hyenas who've put their fingers in an electrical outlet. Unfortunately to, to me and my companions, the hyenas are beginning to cause real trouble. They're very curious by nature, and they started inspecting the equipment, and you can see that the hyenas really take a liking to the wiring. They're just consuming it as if it were spaghetti. We even got some nice single frames of one of the hyenas illuminated by several strobes. So the wait is on to see if that cheetah comes back after we get the system set up again. Stay tuned. So we kind of rejiggered the system and I had it all set up with these multiple strobes illuminating that cave. It just looked like a theater and we'd figured out exactly how the cheetah might come based on tracks and previous pictures. And then a flash flood came, and it just kind of wiped the system away. Wires were exposed, and hyenas came, pulled the wires apart. And then by the time the cheetah came back at last, and it was in the perfect position, you can see there's not a lot left of that camera there. So we only have this low resolution picture from another angle. That's the way it goes. So we deployed cameras in different places because we really wanted to hedge our bets. And we went into this you know, isolated mountain area called Daranjir. And not so far away, we set up our cameras in a slot canyon. And this is what came by. Goats and sheep, perfect prey for cheetahs, big buck brought out as a head. Foxes of different kind, kind of tiny little Blansford fox, quite rare, very little photographed, and a bigger red fox. And then this cheetah, real thin as you can see, and very shy. We went to another area, even farther into the desert, an area called Naibant, spectacular mountain range, was declared a protected area purely because of the existence of cheetahs there. It was a whole team effort to find the right spots to set up the cameras. And then it took a whole team to actually slap in the rocks and disguise the cameras because, of course, it all has to look natural. And then we leave and the cameras have to do their job. And we got some really interesting images from that site. Young cheetah approaching. And then from another site in Naibandan, this spectacular ibex. And then, who comes trotting along? Another striped hyena with a big piece of something else. And then a male cheetah going in the other way. Now, we left the cameras there for more than a year. And one thing that is very different from 
East Africa or Southern Africa is, yeah, it's a pretty severe climate. It actually snows there. And one of the reasons I wanted to set up some cameras on these mountain passes, because I really wanted to see something come through snow. And it began to snow. Ground actually blanketed with snow. And then it began to melt. And of course, these images only came back to me months and months later. So this was after the fact. Began to melt. And then when almost all the snow was melted, a cheetah came back. So, so much for the idea to capture an image of a snow cheetah. But we came close. And then on another nearby pass, this image, I really like this one, really captures that feeling of the ghost cat and a frame of that same individual passing through. But to get attention for wildlife or for cheetahs in Iran today is not easy. Yep. People have got other things on their mind. Economically and politically, Iran is going through a very harsh time. And there's the livestock factor. There's a lot of livestock in the plains. That's where wildlife has practically disappeared. Fewer livestock herds are run into the mountains, but they're often herded by illiterate Afghan herders, hired hands, and they don't have much of a comprehension of how special cheetahs are and how harmless they really are. So an educational effort is really important to you know, work with those folks to you know, safeguard the future for cheetahs. That's Iran today. But I wanted to dig a little deeper because Iran's actually been there as a society, as a culture for thousands and thousands of years. This is a piece that is about four and a half thousand years old that was dug up illegally 10 years ago, smuggled out of Iran, and only repatriated within the last year and a half and put in a vault in a national museum. It's never been interpreted. Look at it. Here's a priest-like figure surrounded by two cheetahs. And then more objects. A mysterious artifact that is referred to as a stone handbag. One of the speculations is that priests used to carry those during ceremonies. But look what's portrayed on the side a priest-like figure surrounded by two cheetahs that appear to be dancing. There is speculation that you know, there was a divinity cult of sorts uh, that pre-existed in Iran before people became preoccupied with other cats. And as far as we know, this could be you know, one of the oldest man-made artifacts that portrays such a cult. For many years, People have been pointing to Egypt as the place where cheetahs were first domesticated some 3,000 years ago. But look at this. Are those collars, perhaps? Does this mean that there is a relationship between cheetahs and people that points at something that we know very little about? I'll leave it to the archaeologists to come up with the answers. Here's what it all amounts to. After a couple of thousand years of coexistence between humans and cheetahs, you see the range has shrunk at a terrible rate. And these dark brown areas are the only places where cheetahs are still existing. And it really comes down to four or five areas. The future of cheetahs is in the hands, scarily enough, of a handful of people who are passionate enough, committed enough to devote their lives. So what cheetahs need, in addition to these champions, is space. Space where they can roam. And unfortunately, there's less than 10 areas left in all of Africa that are big enough to support a viable population. Because you need at least a couple of dozen individuals to keep a gene pool going. And to ensure a viable population anywhere and a future for the species, they need a few good super moms. Thank you.